Hello everyone, welcome to another episode from Fivespire. In this video we're going to be looking at one of the most important developments of Unix, the pipe. Not only will we cover how to use pipes, but also we'll go into the nitty gritty of how pipes are implemented. And by the end of this video you'll have a deep understanding of pipes, how shell redirection works, and how you can build a client-server architecture using a series of pipes. So let's get started. So what is a pipe? Quite simply, a pipe is a way to connect the output of a process to the input of another process. Pipes were conceived by Douglas McRoy, an engineer at Bell Labs, which is the birthplace of Unix. Douglas wrote in a 1964 memo the need for such a mechanism. He said, we should have some ways of coupling programs like garden hoses, screw in another segment when it becomes necessary to massage data in another way. They were finally implemented in Unix 3, uh, almost 10 years later actually, and from then, would help shape the Unix philosophy of highly focused tools that interface using plain text to carry a task. Let's take a look at them in action using a common scenario, and that is running the list command on a directory with a large number of files, too many to fit on a single screen. Um, say the etc folder, which contains many files and directories. When this happens, people will usually press the up arrow to bring up the last typed command and then append the vertical bar space more or space less. The vertical bar character is so synonymous with the Unix pipe that many people actually just call it the pipe character. Running the command, I can then page through the results using the spacebar. But what is actually more or less? Uh, they're actually not special keywords in Bash, but full-fledged text viewers. The last command could have easily been rewritten as less slash etc. But typically most people out of habit would just pipe things to less. So when we use the pipe character, what we're actually doing is redirecting the output of the list command to the input of less. Less knows what to do with the input because the output of list is just plain text. This is a big aspect of the Unix philosophy, the preference of plain text over binary format that would be smaller and quicker to parse, but much less portable. You see this preference for using plain text with Linux configuration files. I can, for example, cat the Apache config file and use grep, which is a pattern matching program to print out lines matching uh, the expression I give. Here I'm giving caret listen. The caret means starting at the beginning of the line, so essentially match the word listen, but only if it's located at the start of the line. I can imagine this was a major design decision back in the 70s where space was expensive and processing power was quite limited. If you think about it, it takes three bytes to represent 255 in ASCII, but only one byte in binary. A boolean is even more dramatic. Say you had enabled equals one, well that's nine bytes, whereas a boolean can be represented by a single bit, a zero for false, and a one for true. This simple concept allows us to carry out complicated tasks with uh, just a small number of specialized programs. Here I have a plain text file containing a raw sales transaction. Each line is a record of a single transaction. The first column is the agent's name, and the second column is the order size in dollars. If I wanted to sort each transaction al alphabetically by sales agent name, I can just pass cat to sort. And yes, I know I could have just written sort and the path to the file, but separating the two goes back to the Unix philosophy of small tools, and I've always found it easier to mentally process it that way, that cat outputs content and sort, sorts whatever it's fed to it, and, and I'm sure I'm not the only one with this type of thinking. Sort also has the option to specify which column to use and if the values are numerical, so you, we can pass the K flag to specify the second column and dash n for numeric and dash r for reverse because we want the largest transaction at the top. So now that it's sorted in a more logical order, I can use filtering tools like head to get the top five or tail to find the smallest five. As text processing is so important in Unix, many powerful tools have been built for such tasks. One of the early ones built in the 70s is called awk and awk is just an acronym of the three author's name. Using awk, I can eloquently get the sales figure for each sales rep. 
Although this is a video about pipes, I do want to go over a little bit about AUK because AUK and pipes go hand in hand. Quickly, AUK treats each line as a record and each word as a field denoted by the dollar sign. Take note that fields start at 1 instead of 0. Fields themselves are delimited by default with the space character, but you can change that with the capital F option. In our case, the first field is the agent's name and the second is the sales amount. The first part of the code we set up an array with name as the key and the sales amount as the value. If you're not familiar with programming, an array is just a data struct that holds the value of different variables. The variables required to be unique. So as awk steps through each line, it just saves the field 1 and 2 into the array, the R array. Uh, if the agent's name is already in the array, the transaction amount is added to the existing value. The second part of the awk command is just looping over the keys in the array and printing out uh, name and value per line. Awk is quite powerful. You can do a lot with it. You can, like for example, if you wanted to print out any transaction over 2500, that's easily accomplished. I hope you're getting the picture of how powerful the Unix pipe could be, how you can chain programs together to carry out either simple or complicated tasks. Next section, we'll talk about something closely related with pipes, and that is redirection. In the last section, we kept on repeating three commands, the cat, sword, and awk in our pipeline. Uh, the awk is a fairly complicated command, and it's easy to forget or create typos. And it would have been just been easy to save the output to a file so we have a permanent record. We could do that by using redirection. Here, we're using the right angle bracket. So we switch the output from our terminal to a file. And with that, we now have a permanent record and we can begin filtering from the record or whatever. To understand what's going on, we have to learn about file descriptors. When a process is launched, three file descriptors are assigned, zero through two. Conventionally, zero is standard input, one is standard output, and two is standard error. When using a pipe, the standard output of a process A is connected to the standard input of process B. However, using the command line, we can manually specify each one of these file descriptors. Just to note, before I just start explaining redirection, unlike pipes, which are part of the kernel, redirection is actually part of the shell. So if you're not using, using the bash shell, the syntax may be a bit different. Okay, so when you launch a command from the terminal, the file descriptors all point to your active terminal session. This is why you can run multiple terminals and bash knows which terminal window to output the results. So you already saw redirecting standard output using the right angle bracket. You can redirect standard input using the left angle bracket. Our last file descriptor is standard error with the integer 2. There's no inherent difference between standard output and standard error. It's up to the programmer to play nice. Here I have a script called hello and if I run it, all I see is hello world, please subscribe to the channel 10 times. Nothing out of the ordinary, but if I check the script, I can see that it prints the message five times each to both standard output and error. The bracket ampersand two means redirect standard output to the address of standard error. You could easily redirect standard output to itself using uh, ampersand one, but that's a bit pointless. So to make the errors more obvious, I will change it to an appropriate error message. You can rerun the command and now everything makes more sense. These oops error messages, you know, they can be a, a bit annoying. So I can redirect standard error using uh, to right angle to dev null. Uh, dev null is something that we call the bit bucket. Things that get passed to it are just ignored. If I wanted to just see the error messages though, I can once again use the right angle bracket to redirect standard output to the to the bit bucket this time. Some scenarios you want to redirect both standard output and standard error. You may try doing something like this, but that can cause a problem as we can see. What's happening is we have two echo processes that are trying to open the file up for write, but unfortunately only one can open and write to a file at a time, so they compete against each other. Okay, to fix this issue, we have to actually use the amper sign. So we redirect standard error to the address of standard output. And yes, the order which they're in is important. If you're using two different paths, then you can write it like we wrote before with uh, redirecting standard 
I'll put in standard error. Um, this is especially handy when you have a noisy command where you can just toss away the output and redirect standard error to a log for later inspection. One more important thing to know is bash supports appending by using two right angle brackets. When you use a single bracket, it'll overwrite the contents of the file, but sometimes you obviously don't want to do that, so you can just append using two right angle brackets. And that's it really, that's probably 95% of what you need to know about pipes and redirection. But if you want to go deeper into the mechanics of the Unix pipe and learn about a new type of pipe, you should continue watching. Let's revisit our definitional pipe. Yes, it's still a way for two processes to connect to each other, but how it's done is quite interesting. This type of mechanism in computer science is called interprocess communication or IPC. Pipes fall under the general IPC category of message passing, a category that includes things like signals, message queues, and sockets. Pipes carry out this task by using a special file. And to understand what I mean by that, we have to take another detour and look at something called the virtual file system. The virtual file system, or VFS, sits in the kernel space and handles input-output duties. It is sandwiched between the user space and the storage device drivers. Things like hard drives, flash drives, etc. Um, the VFS provides a standard set of interfaces for applications to communicate with these separate file systems. So as an application programmer, one could just call read and the VFS will handle all the specifics of reading from different file system types and block devices. This is why Linux can mount all these different types of file systems in the same root file tree. Well, there's one file system that's completely outside the, this root file tree, and that is the pipe file system. The system gets loaded and mounted at, to RAM at boot time and sits on a pipefs. Pipe file systems, like every other file system, will file objects and inode objects. It is these files that act as the communication between the two connected processes. When a pipe is initiated using the pipe systems call, it first creates an inode on pipefs. Two file descriptors to the inode's read and write addresses are returned to the parent process. And the parent process then forks a child process, and that child process inherits file descriptors from the parents. Read FD is closed on the parent, and then write FD is closed on the child. Now what this gives us is a unidirectional bus. Parents write to the file, and then the child reads from the file. And when both processes are finished, the inode removes itself from uh, the file system. Pipes do have a few shortcomings. First, they only work between parent and child processes because they need to share file descriptors to the inode on uh, the pipe file system, and that can only be done through inheritance. Pipes also exist for as long as the processes last. This is not much of a setback as pipefs is mapped to memory, so creating and removing inodes is pretty quick. But finally, pipes only interact through kernel space, meaning that pipes are isolated to local processes. Enter the name pipe. Introduced in Unix System 3 in 1982, it was meant to fix some of the shortcomings of the anonymous pipe. Name pipes, sometimes called FIFO, meaning first in, first out, are called as such because instead of pipes living in the unaccessible pipe file system, name pipes are regular files on the root file tree. As such, unrelated processes can be set up to read or write from the pipe. Uh, and as an additional bonus of being a file, one can set up basic access and ownership rights. As a regular command user, there's not many use cases for using a name pipe because of the blocking nature of pipes. Let me show you. Let's start off with by making FIFO using make FIFO. Default permissions are 666 for read and write for everyone. Let me output the cal command to the pipe. Well, it looks like it's crashed, but that's because the process is blocking until I empty the pipe on the other side by uh, doing something like a cat. And we can put the cow command in the background using control Z. And when we use control Z, it sends the process to the background, but also sets the process to stop. So we can just type in BG to run the process in the background. Now that we have our command line prompt back, we can empty out the pipe. To do that, we'll just cat the pipe, and as you can see, we can we get the output of the cow. And unlike the anonymous pipe, the regular file is there for us to continue using if we wanted to. 
As you can see, it's a bit awkward to use a name pipe manually. We can prevent a process from blocking every time it writes to the pipe just by creating a script that constantly reads the pipe. I have such a script here. It's just a simple but inefficient bash script that in a constant loop of reading the pipe file. If the pipe is not empty, then it converts all the characters to uppercase, adds an exclamation at the end, and then prints the message to the terminal. In essence, we created something of an angry echo. Let's just see how that works. Yes, I know that was still a silly toy example, but the invention of name pipes and sockets were a major breakthrough in computing. Even today, you can use name pipes for a quick and efficient manner to pass messages between unrelated processes. Think of a typical client server architecture. You can use a name pipe in the middle to pass messages from multiple clients to a main server, and from there, you can store it in a text file or a database. And if you add a name pipes to each client, and that you can create complete two way communication between client and server. With this type of setup, you can pass the message with a client and message ID and the server could then acknowledge it by returning an hack message. If the client doesn't receive any acknowledgement in a certain amount of time, it can try resending that message again. Something like your very own basic TCP handshake. In summary, pipes are a form of IPC that has made a large impact on the Unix philosophy. A process has three standard file descriptors, standard input, standard output, and standard error. Pipes are unidirectional. Redirection is implemented by the shell. And pipes are just another form of a file, but just reside in the pipe file system. And finally, the name pipe, which are just like pipes, but reside on the regular file system, thus a bit more flexible. Well, I do hope you enjoyed this video and now you have a better understanding of the Unix pipe. Not just an understanding though, but an appreciation for them and how they shaped Unix and thus Linux. Please don't forget to like the video and subscribe to my channel. It's always appreciated.